Uh, but before we uh, jump into what I have uh, for us this morning, I'd like for us to uh, go before the throne of God uh, in prayer uh, together and ask that He uh, bless uh, both uh, me and and you and and uh, and for and, and and for Him to to allow us to grow closer together so that we um, can impact this community for Jesus. Um, let's go uh, to God in prayer before we begin. Father, Lord God, hallowed be Your name. Father, there's no name in heaven or on earth or under the earth that is greater and mightier than yours. We thank you and we praise you for the wonderful gift of grace that you showered so freely upon us who believe and who have submitted to you in faith. Father, we ask that you please guide us every single day. Please mold us into your son's image. Help us to become more like you so that we can impact this world for good. Father, I pray for this congregation here at Highland Heights, that, it, that, that the work here in Lebanon may go strong and continue in faith and that we may bring lost souls to you. Father, I pray for Anna and I. Please be with me as... Um, as I speak to these wonderful people who you love dearly, please help what, what I say um, to be filled with grace, to be filled with truth, and to be filled with joy. Uh, Father, please be with all of us. Help us to become more like you every single day and to believe in your Son more and more. May your will be done. It's through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So I want to just go ahead and, and jump ahead first into a new series. Um, as you can see on the screen, the series is titled, I Believe. Um, now, these are some things that I'm going to be talking about that, of course, I believe, and I want you to know that I believe, foundational principles um, that, that I believe and that guide my faith. But these aren't just things that, that I believe that I want you to know. These are things that I want all of us to embrace together. So for the next uh, four or so times that I preach on, on Sunday morning and Sunday night, we're going to be doing this series. But after that, I'm, I'm going to be doing something, uh, I'll, I'll do something a little bit different. Um, so just for the next four times I preach, this is what we're going to talk about, foundational principles so you can get to know me and principles in which um, I hope all of us can embrace um, in the unity of faith uh, together. Um, so what I want to talk about this morning is how I believe, and I believe in with all my heart in the Bible. I believe with all my heart in every word of the Bible that it is God's word from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It is divinely inspired by God, our creator, and it is our authority. It is sufficient. It is necessary for all things that pertain to life and godliness. I believe in the Bible. Um, Theodore Roosevelt once said about the Bible, a thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. Uh, Ronald Reagan once said, within the covers of the Bible are the answer for all the problems men face. When I open up the pages of the Bible, I can see uh, the, the more that I grow in my knowledge of it, I see how much of an absolutely extraordinary, amazing book that it is. The evidence that we see of the Bible, the Bible's claims, uh, the, the, the evidence of the Bible's claims um, is absolutely astounding. Um, there's, more, there's more evidence for the Bible, for the Bible's claims and its accuracy than any other holy book in existence today. If we read in several passages of Scripture, and I, and I encourage you to get out your Bibles and follow along with me, um, there are several passages that indicate that all the claims of the Bible didn't just happen in a cave or somewhere where, where nobody could witness it, but it happened in front of a multitude of witnesses. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. 
John says in the very beginning of his epistle, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. All the claims of the Bible didn't happen in a closed room. And the writers of the Bible, the authors, are testifying to us that they are saying, I saw these things. I saw them with my own eyes. Look with me in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 16 through 18. Peter says concerning the transfiguration of Jesus. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased." We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred, on the sacred mountain. Um, the apostles, the evangelists, the writers of the New Testament are telling us we saw these things with our own eyes. I saw Jesus, Peter's saying, I saw Jesus himself transfigured, becoming truly human as God intended, as his face shone like the sun. Peter saw these things and was a witness to it. We read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when Paul tells us that Jesus appeared um, to, uh, he appeared to Peter, he appeared to the twelve, he appeared to many people. And then Paul says he appeared, Jesus, after he was resurrected from the dead. And people don't just rise from the dead, not 2,000 years ago and not today, unless it's miraculous Paul is saying that there were over 500 people, 500 people that witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ after he had risen from the grave. We read in several other passages that claim eyewitness testimony. And And it's amazing that when we read what happened to these people, the apostles and the evangelists, most of them were killed and tortured because they sincerely believed that Jesus was the Christ. Now, if their claims were false, and if the Bible, if the claims of the Bible and the accuracy of the Bible is a farce, if the Bible is not true, then these men were tortured and killed for what they knew was a lie. And nowhere in human history, no other religion comes close to touching the evidence that the Bible gives to us. They had absolutely nothing to gain from proclaiming the message of Scripture, but they knew that it was true because they saw it with their own eyes. And also, not only eyewitness testimony to the evidence of the Bible, but the Bible is the most accurately documented ancient text in human history. There are many ancient writings. There are many, many ancient writings that have been copied down from century to century, um, uh, including, including things like Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. That's how we know of Julius Caesar and, and his conquest and all of the wars that he participated in. There are around 10 ancient manuscripts that describe that event. Aristotle's Poetics which is another ancient writing, there's around five ancient manuscripts. The writings of Herodotus, there's around 10, which is another ancient text. The, all the writings of Homer, there's numerous writings of Homer, there's less than 10 of each, less than 10 ancient manuscripts of Homer's writings. There are, of the New Testament, which is in our Bible, 6,000 
There are 6,000 manuscripts that, that make up the New Testament. The Bible is the, the most accurately documented ancient text in the entirety of human history. And what that means to you and me is that I can be certain, I can be absolutely certain that what you have in your Bible, what you are looking at and reading is the original. That was what Peter wrote down, what John wrote, what Luke wrote, and all of the Old Testament and New Testament writers. There, the Bible is, uh, there's so much evidence um, that, that gives, that, that, that tells us that it's historically factual. Um, just go read um, in Luke and in Acts. Luke was very meticulous about, about including um, uh, minute details within his text. Um, and all of those um, have been proven accurate through archaeology and studying of ancient records. The Bible is historically factual. And not only is, is there evidence, just much, myriads and myriads of evidence for the Bible, there is no other book in human history that has had the influence that the Bible has in, human, in all human cultures. Um, a French poet um, several hundred years ago, Voltaire once said, a hundred years from my death, the Bible will be a museum piece. And it's almost humorous that a hundred years, almost to the day after he said that, the French Bible Society set up their shop in his home. <laughs> There's no other ancient book that has influenced human history like the Bible. From art to philosophy to culture, the Bible remains the best-selling book today and has been since its composition. And also, there's no book, there's no book in human history that displays the power, that displays the power of the Bible. And I want to look at a text that illuminates this idea. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, which is the text that Luke read for us a moment ago. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The Bible testifies about itself. It says that it is living. The Bible doesn't lie inert or dead, but it carries within itself the mighty power of its divine authors. Turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. This is at the end of Stephen's speech, right before he's stoned. He says, This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give us. Living oracles to give us. Many other writings and many other ancient texts that have been written in the past and were once extremely significant to people and cultures are now dead and meaningless. In Egypt, there were ancient inscriptions that they would write on their coffins called coffin texts. That's what scholars have called them. What these are are ancient spells. And what they would do is that if they were written on your coffin, then they would guide you to the afterlife. Now just imagine if you were on your deathbed, if you were about to pass away, imagine how you would tell your relatives, make sure you put those coffin texts, those spells on my coffin. Imagine how significant those writings would be to you to, to have safe passage to the afterlife. Imagine how significant that would be to you. Are they significant today? Absolutely not. They're dead. They're meaningless. They mean absolutely nothing to us today. But that's not the Bible. The Bible is living. The Bible is active. And the Bible is effective. 
even today. Now, a second thing that I just mentioned, the Bible is living. And the text in Hebrews chapter 4, it also tells us that the Bible is not just living, it's, it's active. It's working inside those who believe it and who submit to its word. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. Paul says, and we also thank God constantly for this. And when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. The Bible's contents are extremely active in the lives of those that submit to its message. The word of God, it, it works to effect change in the lives of those who submit to its message in, in, in all humility. It's active. It's working for you and your life if you are a believer and have submitted to it. Not only is the Bible living and active, the Bible is also effective. If you look at the Greek word for active in most translations in Hebrews chapter 4, that word can also be translated effective. The word of God is effective. If you also read in um, continuing in Hebrews chapter 12, 4 um, verse 12, for the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Any two-edged sword. The Greek word for sword in this passage is machaira. And it means, it doesn't mean a, a long uh, battle, a broad battle sword that, um, that uh, soldiers would carry into battle. No, this is more of like a, a large knife or a small dagger. It's a, it's a kind of instrument um, that's designed to make precise and effective cuts in a person or a piece of meat, a, a utensil that is designed to be effective, to make precise cuts. The Bible is living, active, and extremely precise and effective at everything that it sets out to do. Now, I want to ask, and, and I want us to ponder this this morning, and this is the question that I want us to draw deeper into as we talk about the Bible and what it is. We've talked about how the Bible is alive. It's not meaningless. It's, it, it, it retains extreme significance to us in our life. It's active. It's working in our life, even today, and it's effective. But what does it do? The, what is the Bible effective at? What does it do? Turn with me to James chapter 1, verses 23 through 24. James chapter 1, verses 23 through 24. James tells us, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. The Bible, it's like a mirror, but it's a mirror that nobody wants to look into. Have you ever woken up um, one have you ever woken up and, and looked at the uh, the bathroom mirror what do you see <laughs> you see most of the time you don't see something that's very desirable do you your hair is all wrinkled you don't have your makeup on and uh, and you just you, that's not the way that you want to look it's a, it's a reflection that you don't want to see that's not desirable what the Bible says about itself it's the, that an initial look inside of its message and what it's communicating to you is really not very desirable and can even be painful because the reflection you see reveals the truth about who you really are. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 18, 19, verse 8. Psalm chapter 19, verse 8, the second half of the verse. Psalm 19, 8. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. When I look into the depths of the Bible, and I'm honest with myself, 
I am awakened to the reality of my true spiritual condition. I see an accurate, honest reflection of how the Almighty God sees me and views me. It's a mirror that not many people want to look into. Turn with me uh, back to Hebrews chapter 4. I want to read this passage again because it's so very powerful. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 through 13. For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The Bible says that when I look inside of its pages and I see my reflection, it says that it discerns my thoughts. Psalm 94 verse 11 says, The Lord knows all human thoughts, that they are futile. The Bible searches, when I'm honest with myself and I look inside of its pages, it, it searches into the depths of, of my mind and, and shows me that my thoughts are contrary to God's thoughts. Not only that, the Bible reveals your true intentions. It reveals that I have a selfish human will that my heart is bent upon serving my own needs and not the needs of God and of others. And it reveals how my will opposes that of God's. And the Bible testifies to me when I look inside of its pages and I see my reflection back, it reveals, it exposes my sin. The Bible exposes a deeply rooted problem within humanity, a problem that not many people today want to talk about, a problem that not many people today want to address. Turn, turn with me to Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Our major problem, you have many problems in your life, in your, in, in, in your life experience today. And some, people, some people's lives are plagued, it seems like, with problems on a daily basis. Our major problem, however, is sin. That's what the Bible testifies to us. It's not anything else than sin. That's our major, major problem that we um, have to deal with on a daily basis that the Bible tells us. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The more that I read the Bible, the more that I study it, and, and, and I, I understand its, its, its message. And the more that I'm honest with myself, the, the more I see how holy God is. The more I see how good and beautiful and wonderful our almighty God is. The deeper I dive into Scripture and the more it becomes a part of who I am, the more I see God. But in so doing, the more I see of how unholy and impure and unrighteous my sinful flesh is in the eyes of a good and beautiful and holy God. The Bible exposes my sin. It discerns my thoughts and it reveals my intentions it's honest. The Bible is an honest book. It shows me what I really am in the eyes of God. However, the Bible doesn't expose your heart 
to do you harm, to do you evil. Turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. And these are beautiful words of of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Like a, like a medical doctor, like a surgeon who opens you up, who exposes your inner parts, who can see every part of you when he opens your insides up. There is nothing that is exposed to the surgeon's eye when he opens you. And it may be painful. It may be painful when you have surgery, when that surgeon opens you up. But he's doing it not to hurt you. He's doing it to heal you. He's he's exposing your insides and healing you of your disease, of your corruption, of what is tainted on the inside. The Bible exposes our heart, and and, and it it doesn't just expose our heart and leave us helpless, but, but the Bible destroys the old man of sin and death so that I may be rebuilt and recreated and restored and renewed into something beautiful, like a builder that levels a house so that, so that a better one may be built in its place. The Word of God breaks you down to your core and builds you back up into something new, into something beautiful into something that's precious in the eyes of Almighty God. Two more verses this morning. Turn with me to John chapter 6, verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit, Jesus says, who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The message of the Bible brings life to those who are willing to let their old self die. The Bible brings life to those who are willing to admit, I'm not good. I have sinned against God. I'm not worthy of His love. But He loves me anyway, and He showers me with grace all along the way. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. A famous preacher once said, that the object of the Bible is not to tell men how good they are, but rather how bad men, how bad people can become good. The Bible, I believe with all of my heart, that the Bible contains the necessary power to transform the heart of mankind. And all of you have my word uh, that I, I take preaching of the Word of God very, very seriously. It's nothing to be toyed with. It's nothing to be played with. You have my, my word that I will do the absolute best I can to preach this beautiful message of saving grace to you in all truth, in all humility, in all love, in order, so, in order that your joy may not be just stagnant, but that your joy may be full and complete. That's my goal, and that's my promise to you. I believe I believe in all of my heart in the words of the Bible, that they are God's words. That's the foundation of everything that I'm going to say uh, from from now on, um, is that Scripture is the Word of God, and I believe that. 
If you have any need this morning, um, if, you, if you wish prayers from the church, uh, or if you wish to be baptized into Jesus Christ and experience the, the joy, that uh, maximum joy that can only be found um, in Him, and, and you haven't uh, been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you don't know what that is, or, or you would like to learn more, or you would like to study more, uh, we, we urge you this morning, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.